Hello everybody and welcome back to round number five where I, Mystery, go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Dr. Jordan Peterson in another one of his critical breakdowns of Marxism and socialism and communism and all that fun stuff. Now, this particular video that I've chosen for us today is called The Truth About Communism by Dr. Jordan B. Peterson on his official channel, which might I say has 8.19 million subscribers. So just a little bit of influence Jordan Peterson has, uh, you know, basically controlling the discussion on a global scale. This particular video was uploaded two years ago and has 1.9 million views. So, you know, not a discreet video circulating out there in the YouTube realm. Let's see what Jordan has to say about the truth of communism. I'm sure it's going to be very enlightening and convince all of us that this stuff is just dangerous and unworthy of our attention. So I'm not going to waste any more time. Let's get into it, shall we? Here he is, the man. Now Nietzsche said back in the 18, late 1800s that after he said that God was dead, and I suppose that would also mean the theory that, of suffering that I outlined at the beginning that is at the basis of Judeo-Christian civilization, that God was dead and that people had killed him and that we'd never find enough water to wash away the blood. It's a paraphrase, but I've, I've got the basic message right. And he also- But I've got the basic message, so don't worry about it. I'll just tell you what I think and that's all that really matters. Don't read it for yourself. Now look, before we get into this, let me just say, this is very interesting because as you may or may not be aware, Jordan Peterson is heavy on his, I guess, love of Christianity, or at least his enthusiasm for Christian theology. So it's very interesting that he is, look, I don't know if I want to go as far as to say contradictory, but it's very interesting to say the least that he is picking a philosopher here that, you know, has said stuff like, you know, God is dead, which is very much in opposition to Jordan Peterson's usual kind of take on the world, very Christian focused perspective on things. But he's probably, and this is, I guess, where we're going here, he's going to use this person's work to justify his scathing criticism of communism. So you can just see the inconsistencies in JP's work. He's very happy to use people that, you know, he probably dislikes for their, you know, assessments of Christianity. But if it suits him in an attack on communism or Marxism or something like that, you know, he'll be in there first in line to take away whatever he can from it. You know, just, just, just pointing that out. Let's see where he goes Said, with it. There'll be two consequences of that. Nihilism because there's no transcendent meaning, and a move to totalitarianism because people can't tolerate nihilism. And he said the most likely pathway to totalitarianism would be communism, essentially. He didn't quite use those words, but... But here again... He meant that. But he meant that, and I'll he, infer that for you, enough. so don't question it yourself. Um, he said socialism, but I'm going to use communism to distinguish it, distinguish it from democratic socialism. Well, you know what? And he probably knew what socialism and the difference between socialism and communism was much better than you do, Peterson. So it is incredibly important to actually take people within their context and not take it out for your own benefit. But I'm sure now we're going to get this whole lecture predicated on his extrapolation of what Nietzsche meant, not what he was actually talking about. But hey, you know, like we say already, and we've said before with Jordan Peterson, let's not let the facts get in the way of a good story. So ready for the story, here it comes. And he said that probably tens of, hundreds, tens of millions of people would die in the 20th century as we played out that experiment. And then he said, but it might be worth it if we learn something from it. Rough, man. It I is mean, rough. And, and unbelievable. Like, I cannot figure out how in the world he knew that that was going to happen. 
especially so far in advance. But Dostoevsky knew the same thing. He wrote this book called The Devils or The Possessed. You could read that. That's a great book. It takes about 150 pages to get going. But once it, it like everything, everything snaps together after that, you know, and, and then it moves. And it's basically his prophecy about, it's an examination of the kind of person who had arisen in the aftermath of the death of God in Russia, who would lead the communist revolution. That's essentially it. And it's brilliant. It's, it's, it's terrifying. And it's a great intro to Solzhenitsyn's Gulag Archipelago, which describes what did happen when those sort of people took over the revolution. So let's look at what happened after Those the revolution. Those sort of people and we might say took over the revolution. This is an incredible admission here by Jordan Peterson, okay? These people who took over the revolution, not the people that instigated the Russian revolution, not the people that had the foresight and laid all the groundwork for it to happen, but the people that assumed it once it was already in motion. Keep that in mind as we go on with what he's talking about. Please, it's important. Hey, well, this, how about we replicate the experiment a few times? Because you know how it is. If you're running a scientific experiment, you want to find out what something does if you allow it to behave. You don't want to just run it once because, well, maybe there was something specific about those conditions that led to the outcome. You want to generalize it across multiple circumstances. So we might say, well, let's take this set of ideas and let's, uh, let's run it on large scale over a very long period of time in a variety of exceptionally diverse cultures and languages. So let's do that. Okay, well, we could first start with the, with the Soviets. Okay, so what he's doing here is making an argument that, and this is a basis of a larger criticism he has of Marxism, communism, socialism, whatever he refers to as evil leftism, really. But like what he's doing here is making an argument that because these things have been tested multiple times so it's probably it's happened in russia which is his, but he's about to talk about you know he's, it's happened in china or cuba or wherever else he's going to pull examples from he's saying that that is as safe as a scientific experiment process because what you do is you test a theory multiple times in the lab or you run a social uh, sorry a scientific experiment multiple times to make sure you know maybe the first one was an outlier maybe the first few are anomalies and so you do something multiple times to make sure you get a consistent pattern and then you can infer you know you can make judgments from there and so he's saying this experiment the communist experiment socialism has been tested multiple times and so we can extrapolate that it was never meant to be and it fails in all cases because you know it's been done multiple times now the interesting thing about this analogy and while why his argument is absolute nonsense is because in scientific experiments they do make sure they control all the variables to ensure that they're getting a good result with the end product, okay? So what they do is they try to take away as many outside influences as possible to make sure it can run in a perfect environment. And as we know, as we know, all of these societies that have tried out communism and socialism and things like that, didn't do it in a vacuum. They didn't do it in a bubble. They were living as part of a global community and therefore under extreme, extreme external pressures when they undertook these socialist experiments. So while it sounds good, his argument about how, you know, it's been trialed many times like a science experiment, so we can extrapolate now that, you know, socialism and communism just doesn't work because we've we've run through the tests. Well, it's not true, because if it was really done scientifically, then they would have been allowed to run by themselves as experiments and been left to their own devices to see if these theories can technically work. But it 
didn't work that way. So your analysis, your analogy is false and he knows it. That's the worst part. He just says stuff because it sounds convincing. And he always argues that people should, you know, test stuff before they come up with these brilliant ideas. Well, how about you test your own analogies before you use them and confuse your audiences? You manipulative man, you're always doing this. But look, I'm going to try and stop cutting him out as much and just let's get back to reacting to actually what he's talking about. Let's go. People even now, because it's like the 100th anniversary of the Russian Revolution, are celebrating Lenin. It's like, th that's not good. That's like celebrating Hitler. Okay, wow. I'm dead serious about that. Wow. It's not good. Yeah, and, and I hope you that back that up. can dare to think that that's okay means that there's something wrong with the way that we look at history. Lenin was a monster. And if you want to know about that, you can read Solzhenitsyn's writings about Lenin. Because the communist apologists say, well, it wasn't Lenin. Lenin was a good guy. He was all motivated by love of the working class. It's like, well, his henchman was Stalin. And if your henchman is Stalin, you're not a good guy. <laughs> and, and... Well, I, I asked. I said, I hope you back that up with something and that's it. So he said there that Lenin was a monster and he's comparable or he's just as bad as Hitler. And what did he base that on? Because Stalin was his henchman. Like no actual critique of Lenin, just a, a, a avid claims about him being a monster and comparable to Hitler. And it was just because he had selected somebody to be his henchman. And that's it. That's all we got for his analysis on Lenin being a quote unquote monster. Real scientific and objective stuff from you, Peterson. Thanks. I'm impressed, mate. Lenin was around during the early collectivization. And if you read what he wrote, you'll find out that he was perfectly willing to have any number of people die as long as his ideological system could be brought into being. So there's no celebrating Lenin. There's no we're cool, young Marxist, hip revolutionaries, and he's our idol. It's like, there's none of that. Not if you know anything. Not if you're decent. Not if you know anything. Well, so basically, kulaks. if you subscribe to my way of thinking, then, you know, you would understand, just as I do, how evil he was. Again, based on what? Some, like this one person's writings that he's referenced there, and a, a select or a hand-picked number of writings he might have read of Lenin's. Look, this is very disappointing stuff again. I hope he's actually going to start, you know, pulling out some facts or something for us to actually get into here as opposed to he's just, I don't know, just his opinions on it. As I told you about that, there was the Ukrainian famine, that's six million gone there. There was the rise of the Gulag state because it turned out that Russia, the Soviet Union, couldn't run on the principles that it had, that it had uh, uh, laid down as sacrosanct. They just didn't work, so you had to enslave everybody and run your economy you as a slave, slave state, everybody? essentially. What? Um, Do you? Slave and state? And try not to kill the people what? in the gulags so fast that you can't suck some productive labor out of them. There's the death of tens of millions of people. We don't even know. The estimates range from 15 to 60 million. And like, we won't get too picky even about the numbers because after the first 10 million, you kind of made your point. And the fact that we don't know between 15 and 60 is actually an indication of the horror of it. Because our count is off by tens of millions. And that's all. All right, this is a really good point. Okay, like, you know what? After 10 million, who cares? It's pretty bad. That is a really, really good point. But you know what? Two things can also be true at the same time. All right, what about the fact that, you know, the the figures vary so much from 15 to 60 million, I think he quoted just then. What about the fact that that shows us just how little or how poor the numbers are, the details are, the facts are surrounding all of this situation and how incredible, as in like, you can't actually 
take the credibility of a lot of the studies into, you know, deaths of evil communism and all that sort of stuff in the USSR. You can't take it very seriously because no one can agree on anything. Like the difference, like he's saying, between 15 to 60 million is a lot. That is a that is a massive number. Not like, you know, when you're talking about people's lives here, we're not talking about the stock exchange here. So that actually shows Peterson how disputed this information is. And if so, you're going to ground your whole kind of position on communism and socialism and the evil left and all that sort of stuff based on numbers that no one really can agree upon, then like it's really flimsy how you position yourself on these matters. But, you know, whatever you the way you frame it is you can only take one opinion of these numbers, which is, you know, it's disappointing for a man of science. But, um, you know, as we have seen, it's not unusual for him only within the last century. And then there was the 1956 crackdown on Hungary and the 1968 invasion of Czechoslovakia. Then there was the whole like thermonuclear holocaust thing that was going on at the same time and the fact that in 1962 and in 1984, we were seconds away from complete annihilation, right? During the Cuban Missile Crisis, the keys were in the intercontinental ballistic missile release systems and Castro, as he admitted to Jimmy Carter, in case any of you are Castro fans, which you shouldn't be, <laughs> that he was perfectly willing to have Cuba annihilated if it would have meant the defeat of the United States. And then in 1984, approximately, I may have the date exactly wrong, the Russians received an indication from their early warning systems that the Americans had launched five thermonuclear missiles and one Russian decided that it was a mistake and refused to launch the retaliation. And he just died about two weeks ago. So, you know, that was pretty close. So I think he just blamed the entire nuclear arms race and Cold War on Russia. I think that's what he just did just then. Like, like it was like... Russia were the only people that had nuclear weapons pointed at their enemy. Like, where does he come up with such farcical ideas and then present them in such a convincing way that it seems logical? Like, how does he do this? Like, the mental gymnastics are absolutely incredible. No, the Russians, if you're wondering, no, the Russians weren't the only people that had nuclear weapons. Actually, it was the Americans who developed nuclear weaponry and its tech and the technology and then used that on people. And then somehow, I think it was actually leaked to them, but somehow the rest of the world, including Russia, had to get in on the arms race. That's what started the Cold War. The fact that one superpower, the Americans had all the weaponry and then everybody else, once they got access to the technology, started arming themselves. Now, this is discounting like the whole history of the Cold War here, which included a lot of negotiation about disarmament, about actually reducing, reducing the number of nuclear missiles. And can I just say it? This, the USSR, were in constant negotiations with many of the administrations that went through the US during the Cold War period and had agreed multiple times to reduce the amount of nuclear weapons that they had. It was the Americans a lot of the time that didn't meet the negotiation terms. And so they didn't stop in the proliferation of nuclear weapons on both sides. This is a real distortion of what, of, I don't know, of just trying to make the USSR sound evil because they had nuclear weapons, because he's only painted it in that, in that way by saying this. I'm, I'm really shocked by this. Like, this is different to the other stuff. Like, it's quite obvious that the Cold War takes two sides to play, but he's just painted the picture of one. 
and claim they're evil because they had nuclear weapons. Well, this is next level. Far out. And uh, so that was experiment number one, let's say. That, that wasn't good, that experiment. Let's put it that way. Okay. It wasn't good. It was exactly the antithesis of good. It was precisely the antithesis of good. But precisely. that wasn't all. I mean, there's the People's Republic of China. That's nope. a different country. Here it goes. Like, seriously, a different country, right? Different Is tradition, it? different language. Different language? Wow. How many people died in China under Mao? No one knows. No one knows. But I'll Same tell you. Same issue with the Soviet Union. Although Mao was a bigger monster than Stalin, and that's, that's impressive. That's you know, impressive. Because there's Hitler, there's Stalin, and there's Mao. And of the three, Mao was probably the worst. He's still revered in China. Uh, maybe that accounts for their affinity for North Korea, which could still destroy us all, the remnants of that horrible state. Maybe 100 million people died in China during the Great Leap Forward. Maybe. That's a hell of a leap forward. Well, maybe it wasn't 100 million, you know, maybe it was only 40 million. But as I said before, as you said before, when you're counting in the tens of millions, your point's already made. And then there yes. was Cambodia and the killing fields and Bulgaria and East Germany and Romania and the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, that's North Korea, and Vietnam and Ethiopia, Hungary, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Et cetera, et cetera. There's never a successful communist state. Cuba, I suppose, came closest, but it was radically... Um, the Soviets poured money into Cuba, so that doesn't really count. <laughs> so then the first question was, well, are these Marxists motivated by love or hatred? Well, is it love or hatred that produces 100 million dead people? And is that enough evidence or not? And if it's not enough evidence, if you think to yourself, well, that's not enough evidence, it was never really given its proper, a proper try. It's like, well, what would have been a proper try? See, I always think when I hear someone say that, I know what you think. You think Wait, in your stop. delusional area. Before, before you get into your scathing criticism of all those people that would actually like to try this stuff out, well, let's use your science analogy again, shall we? Just quickly. It wasn't tried properly because most of the attempts at this sort of stuff, yes, was done in societies, one, that had to, you know, rapidly industrialize themselves, like basically take themselves from, you know, agrarian societies in a already existing capitalist world full of imperialism and colonialism and take themselves from that position into a fully industrialized advanced economy which is like you know doing that in a couple of generations not only a feat in itself but has some obvious consequences and two there is the factor that we were talking about before which was all of the external variables that were uncontrolled they couldn't be controlled there was a lot of impacts on people or oh, sorry, on these socialist experiments coming from literally from war. They were at war with more superior powers than themselves. And they had to struggle with the war at the same time as trying to institute socialism or communism or whatever he wants to call it to suit his argument. Okay. So like those things, like if we're just taking his scientific analogy here, those Two factors, I think, are massive in explaining whether or not these things could have been tried properly, historically, or not. They must be taken into consideration. Whether or not you conclude that they have been given the chance to run properly and we should never try them again, fine. Make that conclusion if you want. But you must take those things into consideration. You must. I'm sorry. There's no two ways about that one. Yes that you understand the Marxist doctrines better than anyone else ever has, yep. and that if you were the one implementing those doctrines, you would have ushered in the utopia. Yeah, the That's utopia. That's what you mean when you say that. Yeah. And... This is a straw man. You know, they're, they're, they say, okay. so there's like, an idea in the New Testament that there's a... It's always about attacking the person as opposed to... 
you know, I, I guess going after the validity of what they're saying. Okay, so like, oh, well, you know, I would have done it better than Stalin or I would have done it better than Mao or something like that. That's what he's saying when people say, well, it hasn't been tried properly before. Well, no, it's not always about these people thinking they're just more wonderful than Stalin and Mao. They just truly believe that, like, given the right conditions, then things could have been different, but they weren't able to develop to their full potential in the first place. But he makes it about these people being, I don't know, they're thinking that they are, they're just more pure than any Marxists that have come before them, which is, you know, that's his observation, but that doesn't make for a good argument. But whatever, like I said, I'll let the facts get in the way of a good story. And it's the sin against the Holy Ghost. If you commit that sin, no one really knows what it is, that you can't be forgiven. And I would say, well, if you want a candidate for the sin against the Holy Ghost in the 21st century, uh, the statement, communism, real communism was never tried with the underlying idea that if you had been the person implementing it, it would have worked. With the underlying I idea. I think that's a yeah. pretty good that's what he doesn't like. for something for which you should never be forgiven. <laughs> See, that's it's weird, right? Like how he kind of... After doing all of this stuff and like pretending to be objective and scientific and all that sort of stuff, he, he brings it down to a weird kind of Christian analogy of things, like how there are certain ideas in Christianity, Christianity which are unforgivable sins. And like these type of people that claim to be Marxists and think they could have done it better than Stalin and Mao, you know, they are unforgivable. And so like he makes... I don't know, this whole, he gives this whole veneer of being scientific and basing it in, you know, facts and numbers and all this sort of stuff, but then is very quick to judge people on some sort of Christian set of moral standards. It's very confusing. It's rather contradictory, but like, you know, it doesn't seem to bother him at all. And I think that is something that we should all be acknowledging of, is that he's more than happy to contradict all over the place just to suit his arguments. And like this one is actually quite good at some of the things that I've been talking about with all the other videos, which is he has a massive chip on his shoulder when it comes to Marxists today. He hates that there are a whole bunch of pretty much young people out there that will use Marxism as an excuse to not partake properly in society or to blame all of their troubles on society as opposed to looking inwardly and you know self-assessing to make better choices in life. And so like he just wants to attack Marxism and communism again and again and, and explain how evil it is for this and that reason to somehow, I think, get or, or convince all of these people to stop using, you know, or blaming society as the, the excuse for all of their problems. So it's like it's a really long game that he's playing here. But like he could just say that. He could just say it instead of doing all of this other stuff, which, you know, attacks his credibility. It really does, because like it's pretty flimsy, a lot of the stuff that he talks about. So like, you know, outside of very conservative circles and people that are already prone to hating on communism and Marxism because of years of Red Scare propaganda, outside of that, he looks like an idiot a lot of the time. And it's unfortunate because, you know, he's probably got some good stuff to say, but you can't get past it when he talks about these topics. And like I said, he just looks like an idiot. So like... We will continue to try and analyze some of the stuff that he's talking about. Um, but like, you know, it's just really unimpressive stuff from Jordan Peterson in this video. Like I'm, 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 I'm disappointed again, but like, I'm going to have to get used to it. I think he's just disappointing when it comes to this topic. So if you haven't already, please like and subscribe for more. And please remember, I am, you are, we are a mystery.